congratulations for making it here at 10.30 a.m. If you have as much gin in your blood as I do, well done. Congrats to us all. Um, so it's Sifted, one of the things when we ask people, what would you like us to write more about? People always say failure. And failure is quite hard to get people to talk about. But luckily for you today, we have two gentlemen who've decided, uh, you know, offered <laughs> to be very honest about some failures they've had and how they kind of cope with that and why actually we should be talking about this more. So, David, you're up first. Can you tell us about a time when you just, you just failed? It just didn't work out and then we're going to get into that a bit more. Sure, I think failure is something that you experience or have to experience every day. But my biggest failure was when I started Senda. Um, it was a university project. And after graduating, I thought I had the best business plan, the best presentation, and I just had to move to Berlin to execute the plan. It took me one and a half years to realize that the first business model was not working. Um, we'd had, we didn't have a single customer. And the reason why we failed <laughs> is because we didn't do our homework properly. We assumed that product market fit was there and we just kept pushing, pushing, pushing and eventually realized that uh, we failed. So, so what were you doing originally? So Sender today is a, a digital freight forwarder, so a trucking company. We, our first business model, Sender 1.0, we went to do off the same day parcel delivery and use buses for the long distance and then the last mile in the city um, to offer competing product to Amazon and Zalando same day delivery. And that didn't work. There was uh, no one wanted to pay the extra money. Uh, operationally, it was a nightmare. And, uh, but in theory, it was great. But okay, so how, I mean, if you really didn't have any customers, that seems like a pretty obvious sign from the market, like no one really wants this thing. But how, how, like, how long did you try it for before you were like, no, no, this is actually just a, a total failure. You know, how, how much do you kind of need to persevere or a just lot. call it quits? A lot. So it took us one and a half years to realize because we just thought, okay, we're almost about to sign a big customer. It didn't work out. Um, and then we were running out of money. My first co-founder said, okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving Sender. Five minutes after we signed a term sheet from an angel investor for a big check. And it was really a turning point for us, sort of for me, because I thought, okay, that's it. I don't want to take over the responsibility. I don't want to reinvent the business model. And then um, I spoke to my father, who is a little bit my mentor. Uh, and he said, you know, David, you have to try one last thing before you give up and before you file for insolvency. It was call that angel investor, explaining that you still want to do this. And if he gives you the money, keep going. Otherwise, you learn how to, how to file for bankruptcy. Yeah. Luckily, I tried that, um, uh, and it worked out. And then, yeah, with the new co-founder team um, and a new business model, we then restarted Sender. So how did that conversation go with that angel investor? Because there'll be people in the audience who are going to need to pivot. Like, how do you, and then, like, let's come to you, but how do you present that? to an investor, <laughs> how are they not just like, no, sorry, that you had your chance and no. I think especially angel investors invest in the founder. Yeah. So I think the most important thing back then was that I was honest. And I, I called him up, he said, no, I invest in the team, one is leaving. I came all the way to Berlin and two days later me saying that's not working. And I called him again and said, can I meet you face to face? He said, if you want to come, come see me. So I flew to him and then we had a very open conversation about what was working, what was not working. And I think we built a trust relationship in that situation. And this is what then he said, okay, you know what? You're fighting for it, yeah. go for it. Like, what about you? You must have seen companies go through pivots before, which I guess lots of people consider a failure. What do, what do you want to know at that point? What, what does a founder need to tell you to, to make you trust that they're going to turn the ship around and they're worth kind of continuing to back? Yeah, I think it's um, you got to work backwards a little bit uh, to a point that David met, made about having a relationship, a trusted relationship that's built because you have to build that in anticipation that you're going to have some tough moments and tough points of discussion. And if a failure does happen, like one of my portfolio companies, was actually doing exceptionally well and is still doing exceptionally well at that point got hacked and um, some of the private customer information was exposed on the internet and I got the phone call from the founder with 
and it's a phone call that you don't want to get because it could be a company ending event if you are hacked and, and bad things happen. But then I had built enough trust in the team and the founders and the founding team had been enough trust where they said, okay, this is what happened and this is what we're planning to do in the next 24 hours. Then we'll have an update after that and then, then we will kind of regroup every day to make sure we kind of get through it. So all the trust that you earn uh, together to get you to that point then helps you work on the problem together as opposed to saying, okay, how could this have been prevented? And you know, doing all things that are kind of counterproductive to the, handling the situation at hand. So I think a big first step before you get to a point of failure is to make sure you have that trusted relationships around you with your co-founders, with your investors, with advisors who you can then call upon when you need it. And, that's, and, and you would do that knowing that you're going to get to some of these tough moments. What kind of things, what kind of failures do you wish founders told you about more often or told you about earlier? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we, th there's lo lots of different things that can uh, go wrong, but I think that team failure where something's not working in the team is something that I, 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 all of us that are in the business of building businesses should take a little bit more seriously because it's my experience throughout, whether as an investor in our portfolio companies has always been, if something's not working, more often than not with people, you tend to give the benefit of the doubt and you want to delay the decision because it's sometimes somebody that it's, it's a hard conversation and you don't want to have it and you want to give the person a second chance, a third chance, etc. But I think in the context of a startup that you, everybody needs to play their position and needs to play their position uh, with excellence and you can't have compensations going on across the team. So I, I, I do wish that with the conversations between founders and, and investors and even the decisions that you make, you, you make team decisions faster, especially okay. when it's not working. And is that, is that just like C-suite people? Like what kind of level of team problem? Do you, like David, what do you take to an investor when it comes to challenges with, you know, people? It depends on the investor. So when you go to a board and you have a group of investors facing you, you better come already with a solution and not just with a problem. Okay. Because everyone has an opinion and yeah. you better discuss the solution rather than multiple yeah. ideas on how to solve the problem. But on the one-to-one, -one, and that's what I typically do, is I have a problem with a team or whatever. There are a couple of investors that I have in the board with whom I have a very strong relationship um, and with whom I already start thinking about solution, explaining the problem. It's yeah. also important for me to say, hey, it's out there. I shared it with you. Help me find now uh, a solution. But it, I don't do this with all of the investors. Um, you have to have a strong relationship because investors have to understand the 360 perspective. If you call them up and you haven't spoken them, to them for a year and say, hey, this is my problem, they say, oh, 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 something is wrong in the company, while maybe it's something that you can yeah, actually yeah. solve or that is even healthy, uh, a problem that you have to solve to make the company even better. So what are some of the things you would go, you know, like WhatsApp a VC to be like, shit, need some help with this? Well, it's, when we struggle with the sea level management, um, challenges. Every time you double the, the size of the organization, you have to reinvent the org chart. Yeah. This means that you either have to divide certain areas of responsibilities, or you even have to exchange a couple of people that have been with you for a couple of years, or give them a smaller area of responsibility. It is always tough conversations, and it always leads to disruption within the team, and this is one of the things that I've been discussing with a couple of investors over and over again. Hey, how would you approach this? So, Lack, how you must have seen so many companies go through this. Can you talk us through maybe a way a leader you worked with kind of failed? Like, they didn't, they didn't lead the team through that stage very well. And, and, you know, what are the learnings from that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a common pattern. And, you know, in many companies, um, in, in fact, David, David and I were just talking about it in our car ride over. There are team members that don't grow in their capabilities as fast as the company is growing. And this is often, I would really encourage our founders uh, to, to have an informal conversation with their advisors, with their board members, investors, not, not in a group setting, just to say, hey, you know, my sales leader 
gotten us from this point to this point, but I'm seeing some signs that she or he is not scaling and to have that conversation earlier. So this is a very common thing as you're talking about uh, to say this person was with me from the beginning. Without them, we wouldn't be here. And that's the tough, hardest part. And then you see signs that they're not really, their organization is not progressing. They're not hiring fast enough. They're not hiring people. You know, one of my founders said, they're always looking at their leaders and challenging them always to say, hire people in your team that are better than you in a certain area. So for example, if you're responsible for hardware, hire somebody from you in your team that's better than you in a specific area, like doing getting circuit boats done or manufacturing done. So that way you're multiplying the strength of the organization and you're growing with the, with the organization. Is there, is there a way to... Is there a good way, to, like, what's the best way to have that conversation? That's a really hard conversation to have, right? Like, thank you, <laughs> it's been yeah. great, but now, like, you're basically demoted. Like, do, no. do those people always just leave? Are they no, like... no, they don't leave. See, this is another thing that I would say that um, when you see a, a company with eight people and everybody has a title like EVP, SVP, then you really start to get worried. When you're young, you shouldn't over-title. So it is one of the mistakes that I see very commonly made. You, you want to really land a hire, let's say a first salesperson, and they want the title CRO. Then you have to say, okay, is this person truly a CRO of a $100 million company, or are they really an individual contributor that I'm going to try to give a title in order to get them to join? And I would say don't, don't over-title at the beginning. But if, I, I, I do feel like uh, when, uh, when you bring in somebody that's clearly operating at a different level, the smart folks really stay. Because then they see, okay, hey, there's plenty of opportunity here. The company's still growing. It's healthy. It's a great sign that they're bringing somebody new. But yeah, you, I mean, you do see some people that there are some bru bruised egos and they do leave, that's for sure. You've got to be prepared for that. David, you mentioned earlier, so there's people stuff you might go to an individual VC you trust to talk about. What kind of failures do you take to the board? And talk us through, you said you, you've got to come and be like, uh, this isn't working. However, talk us through that. I take it to individuals in, from specific VCs. I think this personal relationship is, is what makes the difference. And when you talk to the, to the board or the bigger group, um, it's more about the targets and the objectives you define at the beginning of the year and then if you fail to achieve them, this is the type of discussion you have, but it's always extremely important to come up also then an action plan and also an explanation. Why did we fail? I have this reflection. I think most of the time, and that's what I see also in our board, it's, it's how we analyze things and how we learn from them that make the difference. If the board has the feeling that we failed to achieve something that we planned or promised and then don't understand why and don't take it seriously enough, this is when I get the most pressure yeah. and a lot of questions, a lot of homework on top of that. So what, um, what's something you take into the board recently? Well, um, our budget for next year uh, is something <laughs> that we, we took in there and we looked back at our budget from, from last year and of course there were a couple of dimensions where we underperformed. And um, uh, we had most of the discussion, interestingly, last, in our last board meeting two weeks ago, was more about why did we fail and what did we learn from that and less on next year. Because I think the board wanted to see, okay, if you understand why this year certain dimensions of the plan didn't work out and you really understand why that happened, the plan for next year makes sense because you took that learnings into consideration. And it was one dimension on unit economics that we probably didn't break down deep enough and that's now the and then the entire conversation about was focused on that and that's now the homework we, we, we took back home and have to further analyze and get back to the board. So how how does that process work internally? Do you do kind of like post mortems when things don't work out? Like who who in your team says kind of all right that expansion or you know those metrics weren't quite right? What's the process to learn from it? We have two layers of management. So we start with the most senior seven, the top seven people within the company. We try to understand on a higher level 
why did things don't work. And it's, it's on that level we try to understand because they're always interconnected and try to understand what are these connections. And then we go into single teams and say, okay, what metrics or what numbers did we expect, what turned out, and then try to understand what the reasons are. It can be external, market, or also can be that our technology did not develop, uh, deliver the efficiency gains uh, and, uh, and the, the innovation that we expected, and then we deep uh, drill down. I think the important thing in this is, again, the exercise, especially with the team of learning and understanding how next time you can do it better. And that's why I think doing, looking back and really understanding why things did not work yeah. is even more important than having the best plan for next year that is overanalyzed. I would rather invest time in understanding why it didn't work mm. out. And how do you, in your organization, and like, how have you seen organizations do this well? How do you kind of, the leaders in your team, set that example and create that culture where people aren't afraid to basically talk about when stuff went wrong? Because lots of people, you know, they're, they're not that confident or they're not, you know, they're not willing to be like, hey, boss, I really fucked this thing yeah. up. Like, how, how do you... It's a fine balance because on one side, you have to be tough and you don't have to tolerate, yeah. or you cannot tolerate if there's failure. Um, that, I mean, you can, of course you have to tolerate failure and you have to embrace it actually, but you, you need to understand why and you have to be tough on calling it out. Um, on the other side, you want people to speak up. So it's a, it's a fine balance uh, of uh, you know, having people speak up and share really what they think, and the other side being tough on them and challenging them. And I think it's goes back to the personal relationship that you developed with this individual that go beyond that difficult conversation. If they know that they can trust you and you always encourage them to, to speak up also on things that really work well and on other stuff, then in this tougher conversation, you can be tough and they still open and talk about what didn't go the way they planned. Yeah, I think this, the, the point about culture is a really important one because it's, it's good to do lip service, but you need to have like some, some of my founders, they actually tell their teams, if we are not failing, then we're prob probably not taking enough risk. And to set that tone from the founding team to say, we are expecting to see some things not go according to plan, because everything is going according to plan, then as a startup, you're not taking enough risk. You're not breaking things enough to kind of really change the status quo. Uh, the other thing is that when, to, to, to build a team with diverse enough opinions so that you can get different points of view on the table and can look at the problem from different points of view. And, and, and also, ultimately, you can't disagree and keep disagreeing. You need to have this culture, I think, of having points of view, bringing up points of potential failure, but then when something doesn't go right, that you are all putting your uh, attention on kind of solving the problem and then committing to kind of saying, okay, we got it wrong last time, but we're gonna go fix it this time. It's a culture that I think the founders have to very deliberately build to, to, to have that diversity of opinion, to say that I expect things not to go 100% right. That doesn't mean lack of accountability, right, David? I mean, you gotta say, if, if you are going to execute, then I expect to see the results. So I think that that's, that part of it is right. To your earlier question about kinds of things that I've seen founders do well with boards is a recent experience that I had is I had a founder who was just fan, you know, amazing, but he, we, I, after a board meeting, I spoke to him and said, hey, it looks like your marketing's not really clicking. And he had the intellectual honesty to say, look, I don't really know what great looks like in marketing. So can you have a conversation with my VP of marketing and, and talk about what is not going well and maybe give him some measures on how to measure, uh, what to report to the board to know that things are going well. So that kind of humility and tapping the resources you have around you in a good way avoids, and, and doing it early, avoids like four months later to say our pipeline's bone dry because our marketing failed. That's catastrophic, right? Like you want to catch it early. So I think those are, those are I think, good examples where a founder can use the board or people in the board who have seen other things, as well as building a culture inside the leadership team to say, include different views, and if you, uh, if you don't get it right, it's fine, but, I, but let's, let's go fix the problem together. David, what failures are useful, like in a company all hands? What kind of things would you share there? And what kind of failures would you not? Because, yes. like, at some, you know, 
people in companies is is nice for a bit of honesty from the leadership but yes from people you know people want to know this thing is going in the right direction yeah. as well right people people get a bit scared if they're worried their salaries aren't going to get paid so how do you yeah, <laughs> manage that if i look how our all hands evolved over time we're now a thousand people we added 700 over the past 12 months and compared to one year ago our all hands is, is completely different i just said right now we focus more on the things that really work um, and call out certain major misses explaining also why, so we prepare that. It's not saying, hey, I ask a question, say, why did you miss this target? We have a conversation, okay, we want a deep dive on this one. And then you have to take it into smaller teams. Because one thing I realize is that in, in a big company, not everyone has the same understanding and also the same level of interest to understand specific failures. And if then the overall feeling is, hey, something is going really wrong and I don't understand why because I didn't take the time to understand the yeah. explanation, then the entire dynamic within a, in a big organization can go, go, go wrong. So I have to admit that we focus more and more on things that really work well and call out certain things that don't, but then already pre prepare yep. to explain why. And you said you, your company grew massively, right, over the past year. What's, and, and there'll be lots of people here whose companies are also going to go through that like super hyper growth. What really broke? What did just not work very well when that happened? The organizational structure. So the last time we revised the org was when we were 250 people. And we sliced and diced responsibilities and so on. We just acquired Uber Freight Europe and we brought them in. And we added so many people to that structure and it just didn't work. Our in product team struggled to work with our operation team simply because the setup we gave them was not good enough. There was so much friction that we created because of the organizational structure. And that's why we just went through a very painful revision of the org structure where we had to change teams, responsibilities, add some competence on, on the top. Um, and it's, it's extremely painful to see how these type of decisions have such a big impact and I hope that's now going to be very rewarding to see that it will take some time that the new structure that fits again the, si the size of the company that we are today will then unlock. Is there, is there anything you could have done differently there? Could, should, should you have anticipated that earlier? <sighs> Not sure if I should have anticipated earlier but I should have acted earlier. I always, and I think that's a mistake I, I, I did a couple of times, you always give it a little bit of time to see whether you can fix it. And I, if I'm looking back, I should have made this change six months earlier. And I always tried, okay, let's try maybe this and this, and let's bring in more processes, alignment meetings to make sure, you know, have a better plan um, and right. goals. And, and, and you always try. I have to say it's also a learning process. Yeah. And so I think the new org benefited from the six months that we waited, but if I could go back, I definitely would also use a less evolved and perfect solution that we have right now uh, to favor time because it takes then a few months now to implement these changes properly and we, 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 lost, we lost a little bit of time uh, in that. Lack, so this has come up quite a lot basically, right? You need to make your, you know, you need to move faster when something's not going right. That, that's right. Do you, have you kind of worked with companies who have good frameworks for that? Because people also don't want like a kind of impulsive leader, right? Yes. Like, get the slightest inkling something's not working and then like fire someone or s stop that product thing. You know, how, so, uh, so how do you kind of find the right balance between being decisive, acting fast and like being really rash? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a, a crisis does uh, quickly get, get things prioritized. So there's a previous example that I was talking about where one of my companies was hacked. So I think this was a good example where the team really got very quickly straight in their head what they need to do. Where the priorities lie? Customers, our team members, and then to make sure they have an action plan for recovery. And so I think that that's a good example when you hit that failure moment where they quickly prioritize in the head. For example, almost all their customers are worried that their data was stolen. 
So they have a very fact-based approach to that to say, and not a rash response, but to say, okay, we got to take care of customers. What does that mean? Whenever a customer calls us, we are ready, like the founding team and the executive team, not delegating it down to the sales team or whatever, but the founding team were ready to take that call, give facts about, okay, what was the extent of the breach? Did your account get exposed or not? Giving them very factual answers. I, I think, and then with the, not forgetting the team members, because then just like me as an investor was worried, is this the end of the company or, was it, or is it gonna go on? You need to reassure the team members, you are doing your best. They're also part of the solution and we will come out of it together and to communicate that constantly. So that to me is a good example of, of how you would respond when a failure happens. But the, the rash actions, I do believe that this is where if, if, if let, let's say you're having a conversation with a board member, David, and then they didn't fully understand how your business worked and you weren't hitting your numbers, then the f usual first response from an investor would be, let's fire the VP of sales. Right, like we didn't hit our numbers. Obviously, it's a sales problem. You got to go fire the VP of sales, and I think that's never a good thing to kind of go down this like triage of saying, because if you don't understand why you didn't make that number and you don't take the time to really figure that out, then you might just keep making the same. So then, two quarters later, you're in the same thing again. You didn't hit your numbers and you didn't fix some other problem. So I do feel like as a founder, unfortunately, it falls on them the founding team to listen to everyone but but have their own view on why things failed or and and then you have to get back to the folks that are offering the handy remedies to say well actually you said this but this is what happened i'm, I'm sure this kind of resonates with you where absolutely. you get advice from people like well this happened so therefore you got to do this yeah, absolutely and i think it changes also with the size of the company i think that the earlier you are the more flexible as a founder you can be in terms of what to do and the uh, more grown up you are uh, and the less dependent the company is also on you, you have to t manage expectation and consider input and thoughts and ideas um, in, a, in a different way. So final question, we've got two minutes left. What, what should founders in this audience, what things should they absolutely take to their investors? And David, what things should they absolutely not <laughs> when it comes to failures? <laughs> it's a difficult one. As the biggest advice I can give if you go to a bigger group of investors, investors that you don't really understand the 360 degree picture of the company, explain the problem, the failure, and come with a solution. Um, also, don't do the mistake to go too detailed in, in, in the analysis. You have to understand the details. Investors don't always want and have to understand all the details. You might confuse them and create even more chaos. Um, so it's, I think you have to find the right balance. You shouldn't go too deep in terms of details, but I like to believe that if you have a healthy relationship with your board, there's nothing you should not share with them eventually. Again, sometimes you have to find a solution first and understand why you failed. But I think that if there's anything major that the board should know, you should approach them with that um, eventually. And lack like stuff you want to hear more about from founders? It's not more about, so definitely in, in a conversation with the board or uh, with the investors, always share material information, something that really good or bad that happened in that company. Time is not your friend there. Share as, don't wait for the next board meeting to spring it on them. Immediately when it happens, immediately make a call to the board or to the individuals and share it with them. Uh, and I would, I think as a founder, the one advice I would give uh, is people around the board and investors always want to give you solutions, but sometimes you can start the conversation with saying, I'm not really looking for an answer. Here's what's happening, I just want you to know, so that you get them off the thing that telling you what to do. And, and to say, look, I'm just telling you, and then I'll come back to you with a more thoughtful plan on what I'm planning to do. So managing that expectation sets up a very healthy dynamic, and as, as David was saying. I know we run out of time, but there's one learning I also would like, final learning I want to share, with, which I, I received from Sonali from Excel, who is, I think, on stage next. And she told me, 
when I receive board decks that are very, very long, I'm always very worried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when the board decks are concise and precise is where I understand that um, the founders and the team, the management team is on top of it. So if, if, if you prepare your next board meeting, make sure you have the right level of detail uh, because the more you get, the, m the more worried investors become. Amazing. <laughs> right, now over to Sonali for more words of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.